is a go and cool. I'm just going to turn the light off. Just a quick one. Um, so there's like theory and stuff you guys can take from this. Uh, whether or not you'd like to is um, down to your choice. But your first assignment is on um, aspects of um, project management. So it's going to be down to you on whether or not you'd like to use some theory from this. Again, it's useful to know. Right. Let's pull that down, actually, because that's messing with my titles. There we go. Cool. Have we been over this one before? You know what? It doesn't matter. Uh, a team has uh, shared goals and reasons for working together. Uh, a team has members that are independent. It's a useful skill to have. Uh, a team has members that are committed to the success of the whole group. And the idea of cooperation, these are important principles in project management. Okay. A team is accountable to its members and the larger community. Again, holding people accountable in a project management scenario is something that I'm sure you guys will come to learn. So team focus, all teams must balance between the small details and the big picture. Uh, the split between the details and the big picture is referred to as the task process orientation. Okay, interesting bit of theory in that. So, a task-oriented uh, work style is attention to detail, independent work focused on the now and closure. In software engineering, we could see something like a sprint chart as a um, task-oriented uh, uh, work style. If we have a task on there that says, you know, create an SQL database, again, we need attention to detail there. We need to work independently on that task, focus on the task as it's happening, and also closure after it's finished. Okay. So, what are the pros and cons of task orientation? Pros, we get things done, quick decisions, it's efficient, and it considers the fine points. The cons, we can miss the big picture when we're focusing on individual tasks, stifles creativity, there's a lack of communication between yourself and other project members, and uh, a general lack of cohesion. Process orientation, Consideration of the team's purpose, okay, multiple perspectives, emphasis on long term, and um, the exploration of ideas. You can see how this is building into the contrast of what we just talked about, right? What are the pros and cons? It encourages creativity. Um, explore ideas more deeply. Uh, allows great collaboration. Can you see sort of this is coming back to what we've already talked about, what you guys have already done, okay? So, sets up and directs, directs tasks, Ooh, blah, blah, blah. too much coffee. Um, cons, you can overlook the little details. Problems getting things done, such as tasks, can be time assuming and inefficient. You can think of this like brainstorming. Brainstorming is great because it allows creati uh, creativity and collaboration, but it can also be really time consuming. If we spend an hour brainstorming and 15 minutes writing our database, we, we're focusing less on the, on the task and more in the process. So there's a good balance that needs to be struck. Coming to consensus. Teams must decide on how much emphasis is placed on a task and process. Team members must all be on the same page once these decisions are made. And team members must abide by these decisions and take responsibility for their actions. There is one way to do this. is a working agreement. Okay? It's really important. A working agreement consists of ground rules, norms, and expectations that guide a team and how it will work together to achieve results, uh, meet the objective and realize goal. Okay? They're also important because they help a team develop a sense of shared responsibility. If you enter into an agreement, there is an inherent principle that you are going to uphold the agreements that you've signed on to, okay? It increases the member's awareness of their own behavior. If you're working to an agreement or you have a contract, you're going to work to that contract because you know that there is an outlined minimum standard of things that you have to do. We empower the facilitator and lead the group up according to agreements. We enhance the quality of the group process and uh, we strike a balance between task and process. Like we said, focusing on one and not the other can be a bit of a problem. And agreements work well if they're well developed and if they're enforced and if each team member agrees to it. A contract is only as effective as the agreeing party, okay? And 
if we find that we write a really strict work agreement that says everybody is going to do a minimum of, let's say, four hours group work a week, and um, due to this, you know, we're going to make sure that um, we're going to make sure that everybody ha meets the minimum requirements for this project. Uh, again, it only works well if it's enforced and if people go along with it. If you know that people aren't going to meet your work agreement, then there's no point really enforcing them in the first place. Having one on paper can be useful. Though. So what should an agreement include? Okay, communication, participation, decision-making, conflict, responsibilities and consequences. I would say the main thing that should be included on a work agreement is the responsibilities, okay? Because as long as everybody can understand at minimum what they have to do, that's fine. Things like decision-making and conflict are usually things that are made in the heat of the moment. So again, understanding these base responsibilities and consequences can, can sort of be that building block for the rest of it, right? Okay, there's an exercise for last time. What is a team? Anybody want to give me a, a dictionary definition or, or their own personal definition? What is a team? Group of people working together. Yep. Okay. What should a team do? Walk, work towards a common goal, for instance. Three. What type of teamwork experience do you want in this class? Yeah, good one, an effective one, right? Effectiveness of communication. Did you address communication, participation, decision-making conflict and responsibilities? Well, that sort of leads us in from what we were just saying about having a work agreement, okay? Your working agreement should have things, this is a, we're talking in terms of a formal work agreement, like a contract, right? Contact information, group norms, when, where, when, how, where, when, where, when, how, where, when, how, that's it. Group ground rules, consequences, decision-making, etc. Expectations, work quality, attendance. What's the file sharing protocol? Might be one that sometimes people will miss. Individual vision statements. Again, what everybody wants to get out of it. There is always the chance when you're running a project that somebody will want to get something out of it for themselves. The rubric and um, signatures. Examples of guidelines. Listen to others' points of view without prejudice. It's just being open-minded. Show up on time. If not, you must contact the group out of courtesy so people can prepare. Be prepared for meetings. Be committed to ending on time if possible. And attack a problem or person. They call that a straw man, I think. What does it look like? Do's and don'ts, guidelines, and results focused. Here's an example. Uh, again, the text is quite small, but um, List of do's and don'ts. As a team, we will openly share information that is important to the rest of the team in a timely manner. Again, these are commitments that we've made. Okay, and another stuff that we won't do might be a better place to start is, you know, things like come to meetings unprepared, show up late to meetings, knowingly undermine the team leader's roles and responsibilities. That's an important one. Plagiarize each other's ideas. Again, this document says it's intended to serve as a list for your team. It's merely an example of how to structure a team agreement. So these aren't everything that you'd include. But they're just a few examples of what you might include in a working agreement. Okay, this is a bit more organized, a bit more structured. We're talking about things that we're going to do for each task, what we do in meetings, what we do in organization, what we do as general guidelines. And then again, a uh, results-focused narrative, okay? And you can read that on uh, the PowerPoint or Moodle. Okay, so we're all going through it quite quickly, but we want time for project stuff. Team exercise, okay, we're going to sort of scuttle through this a little bit, um, but essentially I'd have you get in teams um, and sort of write, write an agreement and sort of draft one to see how it is. I'm sure that you can develop something like this for your project if you'd like to, okay? If you find it to be a useful, meaningful use of your time for producing group documentation, absolutely include it. If you think it can support your writing points, then absolutely draft one. Okay, talking here a little bit about conflict. All groups 
encounter conflict, right? Both task and relational. We think of conflict in negative terms, shouting, arguing, aggressive and passive resistance. But uh, conflict is often between personality types, okay? And um, generally, you know, generally we just avoid or ignore it. Um, and we're unaware of potentially positive outcomes of conflict, okay? So we have to learn how to manage conflict productively. And this can be a game changer, really, learning conflict resolution skills in a management sense, because it can really disrupt the workflow of a project, or it can disrupt it entirely if, if there's a conflict of personalities and, and we, we, we don't address the issue, you know, because because communication can break down, okay? What's some of the causes of conflict? Actually, before we go to the next one, apart from personality types, Ken, can you give me an example? of, of um, what might cause conflict in a group. Dean, you can jump in as well. And uh, Peter, you jump in as well. You can all jump in with your own answers. Let's start with Ken. Um, how, how one person thinks how to do something and then everyone else work before it disagrees. Okay, yep. Here. Uh, what might cause a problem between people in a group? Uh, work ethic. Work ethic. Dean, can you give me an example of something that might cause a conflict in a group project between team members? Contrasting opinions. Yeah, different opinions. That's it. Yeah. So good. So, Sophie, you want you want to jump in with one? Yeah. Forget about me. It's okay. No, it's all right. I can see you. I see you. You know, it's it's recorded anyway, so. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's all right, all right. okay, uh, let's uh, move on. Um, here are some diverse conflicting worldviews, values, attitudes and personalities, different needs, expectations or technical opinions, uh, limited time resources, communication and scheduling problems, ambiguous roles and leadership, could be a big one, strong leadership goes a long way, um, unclear administrative uh, procedures, reward structures and decision making strategies, so, task inspires creativity um, and improves team effectiveness, increases decision quality and team cohesiveness. The more you discuss a conflict or a decision, the more likely it is that the solution is going to be better thought out because there are more perspectives put in for the considerations of it, okay? And then uh, it needs to be expressed and explored. But the intrapersonal of that is that it diverts energy from the issue of activity. If you're going to have a debate with someone over a team decision, it is going to divert energy away from the initial issue, right? It can compromise team cohesiveness and effectiveness. How well you work together if you're always shouting at each other over small little details, you know, you're going to be less cohesive and effective as a team. And another thing it does is it promotes hostility, distrust, cynicism and disengagement. Again, you can think about an example of this, right? If you're if you're working on a prop on an app, right? You you go you leave here, you go work at a software company, you're working on an app, and some guy is constantly second guessing all your all your technical opinions on something, you know, oh I think that we should use this framework. Oh, I think I should write the code this way. And he goes, Oh, I don't like that, or oh, that's not the way we do it here, or I don't like that, you're gonna get cynical, right? You're not gonna you're gonna get more hostile because you think that it's a personal attack, okay? You don't trust that person because you think they they don't believe in you, okay? And you, you get cynical about whether or not to work with them and, and, and then you might even get disengaged. You might go, oh, I don't care because someone's just gonna keep, keep second guessing all my decisions. You can see how easy this sort of thing can snowball, really. Um, and again, it, it needs to be identified, discussed and reduced. Easier said than done, I'd say. And here's, um, a conflict management style diagram, okay? So on the Y, we've got assertiveness. On the X, we've got cognitiveness. In the middle, compromising, that's the golden zone. One of the golden rules of life, in my opinion, is compromise, compromise, compromise. Compromise is one lesson that will pretty much serve you well for the rest of your life. Um, competing, that's not good. That's when we're highly assertive and less cooperative. Accommodating, where Essentially being a pushover at this point, right? Does anybody know what sort of a pushover personality type is? 
Okay. Ken, uh, for example, okay, who wants to volunteer? I need volunteer for class. Who wants to volunteer? Somebody, we'll come up, we'll do an exercise, an example. It's fun, right? It's recorded, no. Yeah, but like you stand up where you are and then I speak to you. Okay, that would be Okay. Peter, do you want to do it? We're winning everyone over here. <laughs> come on. All right, I'll stand up. Okay, all right. Um, now, pretend that you are somebody who is uh, really accommodating in your uh, conflict management style, okay? Oh, great. So, be a pushover, right? Okay? Um, I think that we should use C-sharp for this app. No. <laughs> no, no, you have, you have to sort of agree with me, right. because you'll be oh, yeah, 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 cooperative yeah, yeah. and less assertive, okay? All right? I think we should use C-sharp for this app. Yeah. You, you agree with that, don't you? Yeah. That's the best way to do it. Only way to do it. Okay. All right. Now, Competing, right? Okay. You're more assertive, yeah. you're less cooperative, okay? Peter, I think we should use C sharp for the app. Nah, Python. Why? But well, we, we should use C sharp, it's better. Nah. Why? Python's better. But, but, but C sharp is more efficient. It's not better. How? How? How, how exactly is that? Precisely the same. Well, your opinion, yeah. <laughs> Again, you can sit down. Congratulations, <laughs> Peter. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Well, again, we sort of see how different conflict management styles play in there, okay? We can't be too much of a pushover or else we don't get our own opinions in there, and we can't be too aggressive and compete too much because um, we, we end up, you know, um, we, we end up just coming back to the points that we were talking about. Less cohesiveness in the group, okay? There are different ways to deal with conflict. Confront the opposition, define the conflict manually, communicate feelings and positions, Communicate cooperative intentions and uh, talk. Take the other person's perspective is also a good one. Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Uh, motivate to negotiate and uh, reach a mutually satisfying agreement. Okay, so that's just compromise really. Um, common di difficult behaviour types: the silent type. You don't, don't say anything, so you have to milk an out answer out of them, like blood out of a rock, right? Uh, the monopolizer. What do we think that might be? Orientated? Huh? I don't know, is that money orientated? No, think about what a monopoly is. So all control over it, uh -huh. right? And you've got the intimidator. That's another one, you know. Do it my way. Why? I'm told you to do it my way. You Listen to me. Make that, do that, this one. The nice one who's overly friendly. Maybe a bit of a a bit of a pushover really, sort of agrees with everything, doesn't have their own perspective. Then the unhappy camper, oh, I don't want to be here. Oh, this, is, this rubbish. Why am I here? There's no point, you know? <laughs> exactly. These are all difficult, common, um, common ones to run into, but, you know, you can see exactly where, you know, problems arise from people that act this way, okay? You can just swipe. Huh? Yeah, I'll do it after uh, the presentation. Uh, responding to the silent type. Silent idea generation can help est establish a participation expectation at the outset. Be direct and uh, use breakout sessions. The monopolizer, again, being direct, common theme here. Recognize their contributions, capture ideas in writing and interrupt. Okay. The monopolizer will try and take control of the entire project. So if we interrupt them with our own ideas, that can, that can be one of the ways that we deal with that. The intimidator, communicate you understand their feelings. Explain that each member's needs must be uh, met as much as possible for a successful process. Can we think of any other way that we might deal with somebody who acts like this? You got one, Ken? Don't take any of their advice to begin with, and okay. then kind of let them drip in slowly. Yeah. Any any other ideas on how we deal with somebody who's an intimidator in a group? Yeah. Yeah. You can point out how it's not particularly helpful for them to be that way. You don't think it's effective. You think that if you if you let your feet say that you understand their feelings, and then say, look, you know, the the reason I think a lot of these intimidator types do this is because they don't understand their impact. 
You know, if you go around and essentially not bullying, but intimidating members of, uh, of a group, then um, you're not really understanding uh, what, what impact that's having. That's less emotional awareness, right? Dealing with the nice one, be direct. Check with each team member to make sure they support the outcome of the session and meeting. Again, if you've got a bunch of nice people in your group, just go along with everything that you say. It might be best sometimes when somebody doesn't feel sort of enough to say something, you check in with each person. You go, are you okay with this? Um, do you have any thoughts or feelings about this? If you could do this another way, how would you do it? Again, getting everyone's perspective. Everybody's got value for the project in one way. The unhappy camper, right? I don't want to be here. You know, I want to go home. I want to play my Xbox, right? Acknowledge their happiness, okay? I understand that you do not want to be here. Um, could you please take notes for this? Forces them to get involved. Release them from the process. Okay, we're going to code this a little bit here. You don't have to do it. So releasing them from, you know, specific tasks. Work with a supervisor. We go, all right, well, you're going to work with a project leader. That way, you know, take them under their wing and uh, release them from the team. If they're really that bad, then just let them go. Sometimes you have to do that. Okay, communicate ethically. I'm not going to read out all these, but um, treat everyone with respect and politeness, I think is probably the main one out of all of them. Ask questions with curiosity, not cynicism, okay? Instead of asking, Oh, why did you do that? Or why did why did you add this um, service for for this um, for the, for this server? Instead, instead of being cynical, we could say, "Oh, do you mind explaining why you chose that particular service?" You see, when it's coming from a place of curiosity instead of cynicism, the person who you're asking a question to doesn't feel like you're actually trying to undermine what they're speaking about. Okay, and again. Uh, there are quite a few ways to communicate ethically, but um, those are down to you to sort of um, find out. And then finally, resolution. Okay, take responsibility. This is a hard one for most people, you'd be surprised. But um, if you do mess up in a project, say, okay, all right, nobody wants to take responsibility for it, but you'd be surprised how far it goes, okay? And taking responsibility for your actions is, is a good lesson for life, really. But, um, you can seek assistance from uh, supervisors or instructors for problems that are too big. If you can't do it, get help. Don't take it all on by yourself. Picking up stuff for other uh, members leads to frustration, exhaustion, and reduction in quality of work. I've had to do this before. And I can honestly tell you it's no fun. You're just overworked, and it's very, very frustrating because you feel like you're having to pull everyone else's slack, you know? So, again... Re resolving it can be a, 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 good, a good thing. That's it. Hey, hey. just quickly. Yeah. Do you know why, I guess why Moodle's, we can't access Moodle and Bing say. Because. What's up? Of a, the college has applied for a cyber essential.